Like a lot of people, I recently finished The Mandalorian and was left with a powerful hunger for more Star Wars. I rewatched the original trilogy, read a bunch of graphic novels and books, and best of all, decided to replay BioWare's classic Star Wars RPG, Knights of the Old Republic. The last time I played KOTOR was around the time of its UK release in the autumn of 2003, and it was the perfect antidote to the disappointing prequel trilogy. Attack of the Clones was released the year before, and I was not a fan. But here was this video game, set 4,000 years before Luke Skywalker and the Death Star, reminding me of why I loved Star Wars in the first place. A rare and thrilling chance to explore the ancient, unseen history of my favourite fictional universe. Today, after years spent drifting in the pop culture wilderness, Star Wars is in a very different place. A whole new film trilogy has been and gone along with several spin-offs. The series successfully made the jump to the small screen, most notably with The Mandalorian, which is the most I've enjoyed a Star Wars thing in ages. And Ona Disney just recently announced a galaxy's worth of new movies, books and TV shows. Honestly, it's a bit much, and I wondered if by installing KOTOR I was at risk of reaching Star Wars Overload. But what sets Bioware's game apart, even after all this time, is where it sits on the timeline. Most of the Star Wars stories being told today revolve around the Skywalker clan and other events from those nine films. Even The Mandalorian, which did a good job of carving its own path through the galaxy, succumbed to the temptation. But by throwing you back to the days of the Old Republic, KOTOR gives you a fresh perspective on this universe, letting you witness its rich and storied history firsthand. When the game begins, the Republic is at war with the Sith, led by the evil Darth Malak. The Jedi have been left scattered and vulnerable, with many turning to the dark side and joining Malak's growing army. And that's where you come in, a hero with a mysterious past who joins the dwindling Jedi Order and embarks on a quest to stop Malak and his powerful Sith fleet. Those are the broad strokes, but things get a lot more complicated, especially when the protagonist learns in a very Star Wars plot twist a shocking truth about their shadowy past. Of course, there's the question of canon. It's a great story, but did it actually happen? Another big change that occurred between KOTOR's release and now is that the events of the game may no longer be part of the main Star Wars continuity. When Disney snapped up Star Wars, they declared the expanded universe, including Knights of the Old Republic, as non-canon. That said, some things Bioware created for KOTOR, the planet Taris, card game Pazak, and the Selkath race, to name just a few, have appeared in projects that are considered canon, so the whole situation is a little unclear. Really though, it doesn't matter. Some fictional universes benefit from a consistent, traceable timeline, but Star Wars is like a myth, a fairy tale, and that makes this less important. Who really knows what happened 4,000 years ago? KOTOR presents just one possible version of those events. However, despite the chronological gulf, KOTOR still has plenty to scratch a Star Wars itch. If anything, Bioware made its take on the universe a little too similar to classic Star Wars, especially considering the amount of time that's supposed to have passed between this game and the original trilogy. But I'll let it slide because the established language of Star Wars, blasters, speeders, astromech droids, cocky smugglers and pious Jedi, lays a familiar foundation to tell this new story on. And the heavy Mandalorian presence in KOTOR makes it particularly enjoyable if you've just finished watching the adventures of Din Djarin and his tiny green friend. At this point in time, the Mandalorians have just lost a war, scattering their clans around the galaxy. You run into a few of them, including a gladiator named Bendak Starkiller, no relation to the guy from The Force Unleashed, and Sherrick, the powerful leader of a gang of raiders who loves nothing more than killing Jedi and collecting their lightsabers as trophies. You also party up with a Mandalorian, a grouchy war veteran named Candorous Ordo. I also like Bioware's take on what Mandalorian armor might have looked like thousands of years ago. It's very different, but the T-shaped visor is a nice visual link to the Beskar gear we're used to seeing worn by the likes of Boba Fett and Bo-Katan. 
And like The Mandalorian, most of KOTOR are set in the Outer Rim, the wild, remote, often lawless part of the galaxy where all the best Star Wars stories take place. Taris, the first planet you visit, is like a rougher Outer Rim take on Coruscant. A planet-sized metropolis plagued by crime and ruled by territorial swoop-bite gangs. You also get to visit the quiet agrarian planet of Dantooine and find it besieged by Mandalorian raiders, looking for something to do now that they don't have a war to fight. And of course, there's a stop at Tatooine, the most significant planet in the entire Star Wars mythology, whose desert surface is being strip-mined by the Zerka Corporation. The good news is that KOTOR is still fun to play. The environments are nicely varied, with compelling, self-contained stories relevant to each world's politics and history. The personal journey of the hero and how they handled that big revelation is well written and emotionally impactful. The companions are memorable, both in their interactions and how they respond to your decisions. It's undeniably clunky with a messy UI and stiff animation, but the challenging combat, reactive quests and strong writing absolutely hold up. It's definitely worth reinstalling, even if you're burned out on Star Wars. KOTOR is detached enough to still feel like an excitingly fresh take on the source material, with Disney still sticking closely to that same familiar pool of characters and events, KOTOR's distance from them is worth celebrating even more.